Right. Welcome everyone from across the country. Good afternoon to those of you who are uh, in the East Coast in the Central Time Zone. Good morning to those who are in the Mountain and Pacific. My name is Mark Beckwith. I'm one of the co-founders of Bishops United Against Gun Violence and currently serve as the Bishop Liaison for Bishops Against Gun Violence Liaison to other partners working in the gun violence prevention space we have here uh, today. Uh, what we're about is to offer uh, some of our resources, some of our thinking, some of the work that Bishops United has been doing. Why are we doing this? Because there's been a surge of gun violence across the country, particularly this summer with unarmed people of color. And we in Bishops United felt that it was important to offer a resource to the wider church and beyond to reduce the scourge of gun violence. And the way we're going to do that, we have four panelists that I will introduce in just a moment who will speak to this issue and share their wisdom and their expertise in this arena. And they're gonna have a fair amount of time for questions. And I wanna thank Canical Communication, which is uh, the organizational arm for Bishops United Against Gun Violence. They've organized this this webinar and they are facilitating all the questions and answers and uh, we are very grateful to them for that. As I prepare to introduce the panelists, let me begin our time with a prayer. Gracious God, we gather today out of concern for the scourge of gun violence for the surge in violence and gun purchases. We gather in hope, in hope in one another for our common commitment, our hope in you who is the author and the foundation for peace. We gather to act, to offer the best of who we are out of our faith to reduce this epidemic of gun violence to offer healing, to offer hope, to offer prayer, actions, legislation, whatever we can do together and with you, oh God, to reduce this scourge of gun violence so we might save more lives. In your name we pray, amen. To address this topic, we've gathered four panelists. Uh, I will introduce them together, then I will introduce them one at a time before they speak. We have with us this afternoon, Greg Jackson, who is the National Advocacy Director for Community Justice Action Fund. Uh, they are on the ground in black and brown communities offering no end of resources, hope, strength, and wisdom uh, to those communities and their reach is extensive and their, uh, their, their commitment is so strong and important. I'd also like to introduce Bettina Lanyi, who is the Director of National Partners, Partnerships for Brady United Against Gun Violence, so named after James uh, Brady, who was shot when uh, President Ronald Reagan was shot in uh, 1981. He and his wife, Sarah, uh, have formed Brady United Against Gun Violence. They're 25 years and they're one of the larger national groups and they've been so important in our relationship with Bishops United Against Gun Violence and she is here today. Also, Rebecca Blatchley, who's the Director of Office of Government Relations, which is our advocacy arm in Washington, D.C., advocating for the positions that we take as an Episcopal Church from General Convention and other venues to promote those actions uh, on Capitol Hill. And then finally, Daniel Gutierrez, who's the Bishop of Pennsylvania, one of the co-conveners of Bishops United Against Gun Violence, who will be speaking from uh, his position as a bishop, as one of the uh, key bishops in Bishops United Against Gun Violence. So those are the four people that we have here today. And uh, first, I'd like to invite Greg Jackson to unmute himself and uh, to tell some of his story, what they're working on, and how we might help. 
Greg, so glad that you're with us. Oh, thank you for having us, Bishop. Um, and really excited to be here. Uh, as the Bishop said, I'm Greg Jackson. I'm the National Advocacy Director for the Community Justice Action Fund. Um, I come to this work, frankly, from a very personal space. Um, in 2013, uh, while walking home, I got caught in the middle of a crossfire um, and was shot. And for me, the, the bullet hit two arteries. So my recovery took six months, um, six different surgeries, 21 days in and out, out of the hospital at three different hospitals. And so it was a very hard moment. Um, but in that time, a couple of things stood out to me. One was that uh, there were elected officials all over the country who were turning a blind eye to this issue. You know, I was shot uh, weeks after the Newtown shooting and even with such a terrible instance then, and then seeing what was happening in our black and brown communities across the country, elected officials saw it as a hot topic or a hot button issue. Um, whereas unfortunately in, in my community, it's not an issue. This is not a, a political piece. This is a reality. This is a part of our life. Um, you know, gun violence is now the number one cause of death for black folks who are under the age of 19 uh, and the top five cause of death for the entire community. Um, and this is one of the few crises that are taking so many lives in our country that we aren't seeing the political action to bring about change. And that was the second big thing. Uh, it kind of alludes to the second big thing I learned when I was in the hospital. You know, as, as I was leaving, my nurse stopped me and she said, you know, you're lucky. And I didn't feel lucky right, after getting a shot and trying to recover. Um, but she said, you know, every day, um, young black men like me come in and out of that hospital like a revolving door um, and nothing's changing. And um, I committed to, to try to do something about that. And our organization is committed to ending gun violence, especially in black and brown communities. Our entire focus is how do we um, end gun violence by uplifting community-based solutions that have been proven to be successful, but strengthen communities and make neighborhoods and communities healthier, first and foremost, as opposed to the traditional incarceral law enforcement approach that has failed for so many decades. And so um, we're committed to do that. I, I'm excited to share a little bit more about it. I'm a little tired because we are running an electoral, a nonpartisan voter turnout program and we've targeted five cities and we are literally reaching out to voters in the neighborhoods that are most impacted by gun violence and reminding them the importance of this election for their issues and for their pain and their trauma um, and encouraging them to turn out and to become you know, the strongest voting block in their city uh, because frankly, they have the most to lose. And so. We're doing a lot of that. I'm a little, <laughs> a little tired, but we, we're here and I'm excited to be here and share a little bit more about our work. Thank you, Craig. Um, uh, everywhere I, I turn in the gun violence prevention space, you seem to be there. So I can imagine that you're tired and so glad uh, that you've offered your witness and uh, uh, your expertise to this process. Next, we have Bettina Lanyi, uh, National Partnership Director for Brady United Against Gun Violence. And uh, one of their initiatives that we've signed on to in the Episcopal Church is Voting Access Saves Lives. So Bettina, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Mark. And um, we're, Brady's just, I'm really happy to be here today with all of you, um, Bishop Mark and all of the bishops and uh, at Bishops United Against Gun Violence. You've all been incredible partners for us, working with us on the local level and national level on everything from background checks, legislation to, um, you know, locally trying to get um, stronger gun law ordinances um, in your folks' backyard. Um, and it's been an incredible process to work with you all. And so thanks for having us on here today. Um, I am the, uh, as, as Mark said, I'm the National Partnerships Director at Brady. I've been um, working on this issue since I get, you know, really for 20 years since I first marched in um, at the Million Mom March. And uh, as a parent, it's a really important issue for me, but I've um, been with Brady for three and a half years or so now. And um, the issues that our, our challenges are formidable, but what we have, all of us who care about reducing gun violence, is we have the support of so many Americans, the vast majority of Americans who want common sense gun legislation like um, like this comprehensive background checks, which we, we all passed through the House um, recently, but but did not pass through the Senate. So there are a number of reasons, for a number of reasons, including those, um, we at Brady um, earlier this summer partnered with 
team enough and march for our lives to create the voting access saves lives uh, toolkit um, which i'm probably going to mention several times um, and i'll probably send along a link to you if you don't see one in, in the chat um, and I, it will uh, it's if you go to bradyunited.org you can check out the toolkit which contains um, both information about where to vote and how to vote for yourself and your friends and family that you can share. Um, and crucially, now that we're really, um, the stakes are so high, we're in the home stretch of this election. And a lot of folks are feeling that motivation and um, really anxiety about what's happening out there. They're seeing voter intimidation at the polls. They're seeing all kinds of things and barriers to the polls and they're wondering what to do. Well, you can go to bradyunited.org, check out our toolkit that we've created, um, click on some of the links to find out um, a phone numbers you can call if you're facing voter intimidations at the poll at the polls, um, and crucially um, to sign up to be both in either individually or one of our teams to sign up to um, join our get out the vote um, process uh, that we've um, created with motivate.org. Um, which is an online um, digital platform. And that will provide you with all sorts of actions that you can take, whether you have just a few minutes or 20 minutes um, to spare to, to try to help get out the vote and share information with others. I think sometimes um, it's intimidating to folks to do something like call banking if they haven't done it before. But um, really there's all kinds of information to um, lead people along and show them how to, how to pick up the phone and call a couple of folks and, and offer information. Um, and it really, once you've tried to do it, it really is, um, it's not, it's not hard. It's, it's not intimidating. It's just, you just jump right in. So if there's one message I can convey is please um, jump on our website, um, sign up to motivate.org, share it with your family and friends. Um, every single person, honestly, everyone I know, even people who have only started this year, this election, doing phone banking and connecting with people, the minute they pick up the phone and the minute they, there's a little script you can read, it's just, it's very easy and simple. Um, so if there's one thing I can convey, it's it's the importance of everyone joining in and that there are things really discreet, um, you know, feasible, easy actions that you can do to help and they're gonna make you feel so much better. So that's my, that's my first of maybe several pitches, but um, thanks for having us on today. Tina, thank you, and thank you for all that Brady does and uh, uh, the resources that you mentioned, as far as I understand it, uh, have been posted on Bishops United Against Gun Violence uh, Facebook page, so people have access to that. And uh, as we're learning, uh, getting people to vote is, is an important way for us to not only exercise the franchise, but to get our values um, uh, honored and registered uh, in the public space. Thank you. Uh, next, Rebecca Blatchley is the Director of Office of Government Relations. Uh, they are an advocacy group in Washington, DC. Uh, we, Bishops United, uh, met with them uh, over a year ago and uh, they're magicians at connect connecting bishops with uh, representatives of Congress and senators. They have lots of relationships. They know what's going on. They have the pulse of the Capitol and uh, have been enormously helpful in uh, providing information to us, us Bishops United Against Gun Violence, but also to the church, uh, issues of common concern. So Rebecca, uh, you're going to share your um, uh, latest insights with us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Bishop Mark, um, and thanks to Bishops United Against Gun Violence and Canticle for hosting this important conversation. Um, and fellow panelists, I'm especially grateful uh, for your expertise and also for your work. Um, we do all of this in coalition, and I know that our work is so strengthened and enriched um, by the partnerships that we have um, with groups like yours, so thank you. Um, as Bishop Mark said, uh, I work in the Office of Government Relations and we represent the policy positions of the Episcopal Church to the government in Washington and run the Episcopal Public Policy Network, which is our grassroots network of Episcopalians. So I encourage you to sign up. Um, if you're not already, we work on a range of issues, um, including gun reform and 
the other issues we work on, as I'll be talking about, are also connected. I think there's so many interconnections um, to all of these things we're talking about and to working for more justice. Um, so I'll just say a few things about the kind of broader context and some trends and then, and then what you can do from our perspective as a faith-based advocacy office. Um, you know, we've seen that this pandemic has, shine, has shined a light on um, the inequities in our society. And that in fact, rather than being an equalizer has really magnified them. And that in this moment, we need to do even more to remedy and address um, historic injustices and, and present systemic injustices that we're seeing. So broad inequalities are growing. Um, we know that economic insecurity and hardship are worse across the board throughout the US. Um, but those statistics are unfortunately worse for communities of color. So if we're looking at something like household expenses, um, the latest data from early October shows that about one in three adults are having trouble paying for usual household expenses. Um, we're seeing that people are not able to meet their basic needs. Um, so there were 19 million people, children living in a household that wasn't getting enough to eat or that was behind on rent or mortgage payments in the summer. That was 42% of black households and 36% of Latinx households compared to 20% of white households. We're seeing increased food insecurity um, with about 10% of all adults in the country not getting enough to eat in the past seven days. And then a huge problem of housing insecurity uh, with 11 million adults in rental housing. Um, so nearly one in six adult renters are not up on their rent and aren't able to pay the rent. Again, here we're seeing disproportionate impact on communities of color where um, all, close to one in four black renters are behind on rent and one in five Latino renters. And we know these are um, historic um, facts of inequality that are again, just being made worse now with unemployment rates being variable access to education um, and also the kinds of work that are available in different communities and the challenge that face. So I really think that there's a call for us to address this now when we're seeing how completely devastating the impact economically is on different communities and also on gun violence. We're seeing um, higher rates of gun um, homicides and higher rates of um, shooting incidents. So it looks like in, in homicides in major 20 major US cities increased by 37%. Um, early this summer. And then if we're looking at specific cities in New York, murders have increased by 29% compared to this point last year. And shooting incidents are up 79%. Um, we're seeing a surge in gun buying. So we're, um, we've got three months left in, in 2020 and we've already hit record numbers of gun sales. So just some very alarming statistics. I, I didn't realize this, but um, apparently that since 2008, there's always been a surge in um, gun buying in a presidential election year. Uh, so at least 12% in background checks for gun sales, which again is kind of alarming in terms of how we're thinking about what our elections are and, and what that all means. Um, and then in terms of the impact of COVID also, we've seen again, a really devastating impact on many um, indigenous communities, black communities, Latinx communities um, with uh, much higher uh, mortality rates um, and problems with accessing healthcare. So the good news is that there's something that we can do um, and that's tied into the upcoming election. So, so far, 28 million people have voted in this election already, um, which is a record number. Uh, there's estimates that 156 million people will vote in 2020, which would be an enormous increase from the um, 139 million who cast ballots in 2016. So there's people already out there voting. Um, many states are enabling in-person voting or drop-off um, for mail-in ballots. And there's the opportunity to vote in representatives who will take action um, on gun reform and on these other issues that contribute to um, community well-being, as, as Greg was speaking about, the kind of community-oriented solutions that we really need. Um, so there, there's some encouragement. And then, of course, the great work of organizations like Brady, who have incredible resources on how to vote and, and um, toolkits for individuals, for community groups to encourage friends and family to vote too. So, the Episcopal Church has also similar resources that um, are aimed to support you in, in voting and in planning your vote and um, having resources that enable you to, to reach out to others in your, in your network to get them to vote as well. So I would encourage you to look at those. Um, just two other pieces I would say is, is another, as we head up to the election, I think another thing we can all do 
um, to make sure that we're voting in good folks is to fight misinformation, to not share misinformation, um, because I think that that can really undermine uh, you know, our faith in democracy. It can undermine the election and, and I think is damaging across the board. Um, and we can also, even now in these weeks leading up to the election, push for COVID relief. Um, we know that we need additional assistance for um, low-income families, uh, and we need Congress to pass a stimulus bill, which I think will in part address some of the challenges we're seeing around gun violence. And uh, we all can continue to push, even at the end of this Congress, and certainly looking ahead for gun reform, so at the local level, but also at the federal level, where we know that the change can be magnified um, because people can cross state lines, and we know that um, illegal firearms cross lines as well. Um, so really pushing for federal gun reform um, and then COVID relief in the short term and doing all we can to vote. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you for the role that you play. I think it's become obvious to those who are part of this webinar that not only do you take uh, what the Episcopal Church is uh, advocating for and present that to Congress, you take what you know and disseminate it uh, to the wider church. And so you're communicating on both levels and certainly heard that and thank you for that. Um, uh, before introducing uh, Bishop Gutierrez, I wanna welcome Ian Douglas, one of the co-conveners uh, of Bishops United Against Gun Violence who uh, has joined us and will be joining us at the end. Uh, but now I wanna turn it over to Bishop Gutierrez, uh, Bishop of Pennsylvania and uh, his perspective on what we've been talking about. Daniel. Uh, Bettina, Greg, Rebecca, Mark, Chemical Communications, the Bishops United Against Gun Violence. Uh, thank you for your work and your ministry. I'm blessed to serve with you and all this ministry. You bless me and all of us. As Mark mentioned, I'm Daniel Gutierrez. I serve uh, the beautiful and faithful people living in the Diocese of Pennsylvania. I became a part of Bishops United Against Gun Violence because of the ministry of the bishops from across the Episcopal Church in both the sacred and the secular realms. There is a great pain in this world. There is a sad knowing that many in daily life forget to look at our siblings in the world and the pain that they suffer. It seems like everything else, we have become an individualistic society. It's me rather than we and Part of this work in this ministry is to develop a reference point beyond the private eye. As we know, we have become a dispensable culture, whether it be electronics, plastics, and now it seems the dispensable culture mentality has transcended to how we view one another. And the evil of gun violence is indicative of it. We cannot forget what it means to be human and our connection with all of humanity. You know, I often ask what happened that we don't live life from one sacred moment to the next, from one from holy acts of love and compassion to another. Look around this world and look around our country. How many groups have been created to address the various evils in the world? And that tells us, it should tell all of us that there is a disease of conscience and soul that is hurting God's creation, where one can easily pull the trigger and changes everything. We have to use the systems that are in place. Um, I understand what affects the political process because I spent a lifetime in politics and government before my call to ministry. Voting allows us to express our faith through that transformative process called the voting booth. And our votes do matter. We cannot allow elected officials to ignore or pretend that gun violence, the scourge of gun violence, that this crisis that is taking lives, lives created in the image of the Holy One does not exist. Our hearts and our faith cannot allow elected officials to ignore or forget or just pass by this evil of gun violence. But at the same time as bishops and bishops united against gun violence, and um, I call 
all the faithful apprentice, because we're called to be apprentice of Jesus Christ. We cannot lose that foundation because it calls us to something deeper because we are called to live as bishops, as laities, as, as deacons, as priests, as the one, we follow the one who was peace, mercy, forgiveness, and love. We have to touch people's hearts so that the heart will inform their minds. And it has to be done through Jesus Christ. We are called as Christians, and I really believe this, to redeem the pain of gun violence through the love of Christ. Because out of the worst that life offers, great good will come. And that is what we're doing today. And that's why we have these amazing partners. And each one of you who are joining us today, we just need to lock arms and walk out in the world, lock arms and walk into the voting booth and walk out with the hope of a new and loving and peaceful world where people of all colors will never have to worry that their lives will be lost. So that's, I wanna turn it over and I'm just blessed to be with you at this time. Thank you, Mark. Daniel, thank you. Thank you for your witness, for your passion, for being part of the leadership of Bishops United Against Gun Violence. We now have uh, some time for questions uh, to be submitted to the panelists. Actually, the questions will be submitted to me, and then I will pass them on to uh, the panelists. And um, uh, if you would like, you can identify yourself in your question and where you're from. Uh, you don't have to do that, but uh, would um, invite you to offer your questions now. Please use the Q&A bu uh, button at the bottom of your screen. As uh, questions start to come in, one thing that uh, I have read and research has shown that uh, the most effective way to get, one of the most effective ways of getting people to vote is after you vote to text four friends to ask them to vote. It's a personal contact. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're enjoining people to uh, text their friends after they vote. Uh, if they do it on election day or they do before election day uh, to get them to vote and ask them to do the same thing, to spread it around. Uh, question for Greg Jackson. Community Justice Action Fund has spoken out about police violence as a gun violence issue and about stand your ground laws as an invitation to gun violence. How can Episcopalians advocate against these kinds of gun violence in our communities? Awesome, that's a great question. Um, you know, we strongly believe that the number one way to reduce violence is to invest in the communities being most impacted. Um, and investing means investing in solutions that we know work, that are evidence-based programs like Advanced Peace um, that does cognitive behavior therapy approach to the people, individuals who are most at risk of being a victim or an offender of gun violence. Programs like Life Camp Inc. Uh, in Jamaica, Queens that focuses on making the entire community one that celebrates life and uh, the culture shift from, from violence to a more peaceful life. Um, also programs, uh, violence intervention and prevention programs like Safe Streets in Baltimore. Um, there are these programs all over the country that are frankly are underfunded or completely dependent on private dollars to, to remain afloat, um, but are in dire need of more government support. And so the first big thing I would say is that we should all be advocating for more resources to um, invest in these community-based programs to reduce gun violence. At this point, um, from the federal government perspective, we spend over $3 billion um, in law enforcement related grants and funding, um, but less than $30,000 in these types of proactive programs that we know have been successful across the country. Um, so that is the first thing is just, we need to be advocating everywhere for our leaders to invest in these programs that uplift the people that are being impacted by gun violence as opposed to uh, incarcerating them um, or approaches that, that focus on that incarceral side of things. 
the other thing, I think you mentioned staying your ground laws. Um, you know, there have been a lot of statistics done on the impact of laws like staying your ground laws in every major state where it's been passed. They've seen an increase in homicides um, and not just justified homicides, increase in homicides, period. Um, and so we've just seen this almost like night and day that these types of laws encourage folks to take justice into their own hands um, with guns, um, as opposed to leaning on our criminal justice system. And depending on how you feel about it, um, we all know that we don't want everyone <laughs> out there trying to be, be the law and order um, with their own handguns in their own neighborhoods. Um, and we've seen how that's played out very negatively. Um, we saw that with the death of Ahmaud Arbery, someone who was on a jog and chased down, um, shot and killed. Um, and one of the defenses of the defense attorney was they were acting within staying your ground. And so we gotta prevent situations like that from happening. Uh, stand your ground laws exist in 25 states. Um, so this isn't a small Southern state problem or isolated problem. This is something that governments across the uh, country have adopted. Uh, we were able to work with um, some of the Ohio leaders um, and some of our partners here on the ground uh, and a part of this call as well to fight against uh, stand your ground laws in Ohio. And we successfully defeated the bill um, in committee. So we we're really proud of that. Um, but what we found is that when folks organize and advocate uh, around defeating these types of bills, we can be successful with a very small group um, because this is a, a very easy win for us when you look at the statistics about how these laws are impacting communities. So two things, fight for more investment from your leaders, and that can be state level, city level, um, or federally, obviously. Um, but then also we need to keep seeking out these laws that are increasing violence in our community and pushing back on them. Um, a lot of them are being packaged as ways to make communities safer, but the statistics show differently. Thank you, Craig. And uh, one of the things that Bishops United came up with uh, four or five years ago is the unholy trinity, poverty, racism, and gun violence, that they're linked. And we're discovering that we have some dioceses in the Episcopal Church who are connected to Bishops United Against Gun Violence that are investing in communities to uh, lift people out of poverty because that reduces gun violence. And I also want to um, commend Greg and Community Justice Action Fund for the many programs, training and advocacy programs they offer in cities in various places around the country. And uh, we will make sure that though the information for those programs are made available uh, because it's extraordinary training and lifts people up. So I want to thank you for that. Um, the next question is um, uh, to Bettina, uh, what is the current gun violence legislation in Congress now and how can we advocate? Thanks so much for, um, for that question. Um, it's, there are a number of, uh, of gun legislation, um, of legislations that have been proposed but have, have not been passed. Um, they have been passed by the House of Representatives, but not, which is a gun violence prevention majority that we have in the House, but have not been brought to a vote um, in the Senate. And overwhelmingly, the most important and the largest of these is um, H.R. 8, um, S. 42, the um, background checks legislation that was passed by the House well over a year ago um, and still has never been brought to a vote by um, Senate Majority Leader um, McConnell um, and, and is not supported by the current president. Um, the reason this is so crucial is that currently about one in five um, guns sold in the U.S. Are, are sold without a background check. So it is just very basic. It's legislation that um, over 90% of all Americans support, um, but it is not being brought by to a vote because we don't have a supportive gun violence prevention majority in the Senate as well as the House, and we don't have a president who supports common sense gun legislation. Um, and so therefore, it's, it's really crucial that we uh, make sure that folks are represented at the polls because um, stymieing the turnout um, is part of what um, prevents us from passing legislation that most of the public supports, quite frankly. And when you have special interest groups um, like um, uh, 
anti-gun violence prevention uh, legislation uh, or uh, lobbyists rather um, supporting candidates that um, so then then go on to support legislation that's not um, that's not supported by the majority of Americans. That's when you can't pass common sense um, gun legislation. So I think that's that's really the crux of what we need to get done in the next Congress um, and with the next next president and the next Senate. And that's what we're hoping to do. Uh, Bettina or Rebecca, do we know how many gun violence um, uh, legislations have been passed by the House and are sitting on McConnell's desk? I mean, we've I heard got it's over 100. I don't know if they're all gun violence, but we have like, the, the, besides background checks, there's Charleston loophole, which is, um, which is really crucial and um, permitted um, permitted someone to uh, a prohibited purchaser to get a gun and, and shoot up a, um, a church in Charleston. Um, I mean, it just really base the basic things that um, put guns in the hands of those who are prohibited and shouldn't shouldn't have them or shouldn't have access to them in the first place. Um, I, don't, I don't have an exact number of how many there are, but there are a lot of much more minor and yet still important ones. Um, but that's the main thing. If you can't prevent, if you can't just do the basics, if we can't prevent um, those who are already prohibited um, from buying a gun, if we can't stop them from buying one, for instance, at gun shows or over the internet where you can still freely buy guns no matter who you are, um, then really there's a there's a lawlessness um, that we we, that's part of the chaos that we can't control in terms of gun violence, and then we cannot reduce these deaths. And so it's a basic. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question. We know that access to a gun makes it five times more likely an abuser will kill his female victim. And we know that domestic violence has spiked during pandemic shutdowns. What do we need to do to protect women and children at risk of gun violence in their homes, especially now? And I invite any of you to respond to that. Rebecca, I think I'll start with you. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's a really important piece of it. And, and I would say statistics on this are hard to come by, um, both on child abuse and on intimate partner violence. Um, the UN has a, has a good report out about um, violence against women and girls during COVID-19 um, that so in France, their, their research shows that there's been an increase of domestic violence reporting of um, 30% since the lockdown in March. Um, in many other countries around the world, there's better data. In the US, it, it, the collection varies more, so it can be harder to look at national trends. And I think we're all aware that we're not necessarily seeing the full picture right now, that we maybe won't be able to see the full extent until after. Um, you know, I'd say on the legislative side, as Bettina mentioned, you know, I think the Charleston loophole, I think some of the sensible gun reform laws would go a, a long way towards um, keeping guns out of the hands of people who have um, criminal offenses that would disqualify them because of potential fear of intimate partner violence. Um, you know, there may be a ministry component of that that I'm not equipped to answer um, in terms of what we can do now during this time, but I would say, you know, certainly make sure that we can pass the gun reform laws. And then as we've said, this whole conversation also enable there, that there be sufficient um, supports for communities. So I would just highlight something as state and local funding um, as a really critical piece of um, COVID relief, relief legislation. A lot of um, local you know, shelters and, and hotlines and things are have federal government support. And so if there's not, if, if states are cutting budgets drastically and cutting education budgets and cutting, you know, um, all kinds of services for people, that may be a service that goes away, um, whether it's, you know, a shelter or a hotline or other support. Uh, we need to keep those in place when we know that there's people who are in particular uh, risk in this moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Bettina and then B Bishop Gutierrez wanted to respond to this question. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, the, the question is, um, how are we, are we moving on to this? Uh, we want to focus on this question. Protect women and children at risk of gun violence in their homes, especially now. I think the, um, the you also mentioned the, I, I don't know if you mentioned the Violence Against Women's Act as well. Um, and that's one that we want to make sure to, it passed the House and it didn't pass the Senate. Um, and that is, it, it's really crucial for us to really recognize the, um, the protections that we need to give to women and children um, 
So that's that's another one of the many bills that th that Bishop Beckwith mentioned um, and referenced that we need to make sure to have representation in place, so that um, that these kinds of um, these kinds of bills can be passed by the House and the Senate and signed into law. And until we do that, we can't get too far. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank Mark, you. if I if if yeah. I can jump in, sure here too. Um, Bishops United Against Gun Violence is also partnering with Brady with respect to helping to ensure safe gun storage. So that's both on the suicide um, side and also on the um, question of domestic violence. So that, not that that would limit all realities of domestic violence and particularly uh, using firearms against partners, but also we can go a long ways to help ensure that gun owners do have safe storage. And I think Bishops United is, has worked with and is committed to um, advancing education and support for such ventures in each of the states we live in. Thank you, Ian. Welcome to the panel. And uh, Daniel, you wanted to, to weigh in. Yeah, I wanted this. just to, part of what Greg and Bettina and Rebecca have said throughout this conversation is that it's like a spider web. And often we forget and we focus on elections on the national level, the presidential, but the importance of local elections uh, that address mental health, the elected officials who will uh, make those decisions about these safety nets of mental health, of hunger, food scarcity, education and funding for education, home ownership, domestic violence, uh, abuse, these safety nets uh, that address things like suicide. And that's why our faith that informs how we move out in the world, um, even police departments, uh, make an impact on the local level in the U.S. Senate, in the U.S. House, and in the presidential election. So that is the importance of our voice. And I would encourage all the Episcopalians um, to pick up the phone and call your local and national officials and identify yourself as a member of the faith community because and identify yourself as a member of your Episcopal church. I think that's an important witness that leads to uh, effectuate change. Um, your voice does matter and your faith forms that voice. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question is uh, directed to Bishop Douglas, uh, one of the co-conveners of uh, Bishops United. And this is from Rex McGee, who is a deacon at St. John the Baptist Church in Minneapolis. Specifically, are there conversations with the bishops group for guidance on defunding and restructuring police departments? to move them away from militarist, militarist organizations to peacekeepers. We here in Minneapolis continue to work with the repercussions of the murder of George Floyd and reformating, reformatting the police departments here. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Deacon, and I'm, I miss your last McGee. name, for McGee. McGee, for, McGee for your ongoing work as far as witnessing against anti-Black bias, particularly in policing, particularly in Minneapolis. Thank you for your hard and good work. Um, as a uh, network, the Bishops United Against Gun Violence, we've spoken about the realities of anti-Black bias and anti-Black violence in the policing of our nation and the police forces. We have not come out with a um, yet uh, a position paper or a set of standards or protocols, directions that we would encourage our uh, bishops and dioceses to pursue. It's something that we could think about if, if it would be helpful. Um, there is clear commitment uh, and recognition and the need for lament, and I'll say a little bit more about this later, of how um, communities of color, specifically African-American communities, have been and use the wrong, the right metaphor here, targeted uh, with respect to violence as perpetrated by um, police departments across our nation and historically, and the close, the close relationship between policing and white supremacy in our nation. And so the need to repent of that, to work against um, 
such violence is is front and center in our work, although we have not yet come to a position or a agreed statement is it are we calling for defunding the police or police reform or um, you know that's still before us. Daniel, I don't know you or Mark Daniel, you're a co-convener too, but we haven't yet taken a clear position as far as what strategy to pursue. No, we haven't, uh, but it's, it's, it's an important issue. And uh, uh, historian Jill DePore, who teaches at Harvard and writes for The New Yorker, uh, reports that $8 billion worth of military equipment has pa been passed from the military to police departments since 1997. Uh, so in 20 years, $8 billion of equipment. So we're militarizing uh, uh, the police. And, uh, and some would argue, and I think Jill Lepore is one who would argue, as more guns are around, uh, the police need to arm themselves. So it's just an escalation of, of guns on both sides, which just make for a cauldron of, of disaster. Uh, Greg, any, any, any thoughts about this? Uh, um, of police departments and, and this, this difficult but important topic? Yeah, I mean, you know, just from a personal position, you know, I've had police pull the gun on me four times in my life. Um, one time when I was walking to my dorm room in college, you know, another time when I was picking up pizza outside of a restaurant <laughs> that was open, it was like a Papa John's. And uh, this is, I mean, what we're seeing in the media is not the exception, unfortunately. Um, you're just, you, we're just seeing firsthand what the black community has been going through for decades. Um, and it's not just inner city. I mean, I grew up in rural Virginia, um, college educated, all of that. And I still went through all of that. And I could say the same for my little brother, <laughs> uh, multiple family members. Um, so it's a real crisis. Um, I think that the bigger concern for me, though, is when we think about gun violence, we know that increasing law enforcement does not have a, a, a clear enough impact on reducing the numbers around gun violence. You know, there are multiple ways to address gun violence, and the law and order approach is one of the least effective um, and has, you know, some of the worst outcomes of, as we saw this summer. And so while we're not necessarily saying where you know, where the dollars need to come from. I think the biggest thing is that we do need to invest more in proactive programs and approaches to reduce gun violence, um, as opposed to a reactive um, approach, which is what law enforcement, you know, uh, inherently is, at least for the most part. Um, and so I, I just hope that everyone just look at, look, you know, take a inventory of your own city um, and look at how those dollars are being spent and continue to be advocates. Um, I, I shared with you, there's a website called costofpolice.org and you can go on there and look at your budget for your city and look at the line items and see, oh, wow, we're spending this amount of money on policing, but only this amount of money in schooling, you know, um, and, and be those advocates uh, because it does look different in every city. Um, one other big thing we advocate for um, are that offices, I mean, are that states and cities create their own office of violence prevention that can take a comprehensive look at reducing violent crime um, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of you have family or friends that are police officers. I know I do, and I've also done ride-alongs with law enforcement. And I think the biggest thing that was very obvious is that they're overwhelmed. I mean, you have police officers trying to manage all of these different types of emergencies when they aren't necessarily equipped for all of that. Um, and a lot of the struggles that communities are facing needs a comprehensive governmental approach, not just a policing law enforcement approach. And so. Um, offices of Violence Prevention, that's exactly what they focus on. Uh, in Milwaukee, they have a really great um, resource they created called Blueprint for Life, where they laid out how do we reduce gun violence in a comprehensive approach, um, bringing in the housing department, bringing in education, bringing in the health department, and just working all those levers to turn down the, the rate of violent death that's happening in, in that city. Um, and I think that type of proactive, comprehensive approach um, requires investment and it requires uh, some advocates to actually get to be built out. Um, we were excited this year. Um, Austin, Texas has decided to open their own Office of Violence Prevention. We've seen southern states and northern states um, starting to look at these solutions and look at things more uh, comprehensively. And I think a lot of that is in response to the death of George Floyd and so many others, but also 
because of the advocacy that's happened with groups like yours that have pushed for more than just policing to address this crisis. And I think uh, to go with Ian, what he said, I think it's important because not only bishops united against gun violence, but leaders from our churches, it's important to meet with police departments and, and to look at the root causes um, and advocate for, as you say, the distribution of funding for mental health emergencies, um, mental health units um, that are precursors to a lot of the violence that we're seeing and the reactions. So uh, we're perfectly suited as, as church and bishops because uh, we're in the community day by day, close to the people um, and it's shepherding with the flock. Thank you. Uh, this next question, uh, I'll start with Bettina to respond to it uh, from Brandon Beck, an Episcopalian in Texas. What are you and the organizations with which you work doing to address the typically unjust treatment of people assumed to be mentally ill by law enforcement, often resulting in death by gun? Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks um, for that question. Um, I think one of the real hurdles we've had to addressing the gun violence problem is that um, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions out there. And one of the most damaging one for both reducing gun violence and also for folks in crisis and folks uh, with mental illnesses is that there's, there's a false narrative that's um, being pushed, been pushed out for a very long time that links um, mental health mental illness with um, uh, shooters, mass shooters. Um, and that's simply um, not the case. Um, what we've done at Brady is we work with a number of mental health uh, partners, including the American Psychological Association and Mental Health America to really dispel these myths. Um, one of the uh, most powerful examples was um, last year following the, um, the shootings in El Paso when there were, there were a number of individuals and um, politicians and folks who um, tried to push the narrative that um, this was a mental health issue, this was not a regulation issue. And that's just a smokescreen to avoid um, common sense rules on um, protecting, um, protecting gun laws. So, um, so we um, worked with these groups to put out a press release and work with news organizations to try to educate them on the statistics, which are that less than, uh, I, I want to get this right, less than, at least less than 5% of, um, of mass shootings are carried out by someone with a, with a mental illness. And the problem is that it, it further stigmatizes those who seek help for a health condition. Um, and it prevents us from doing exactly what, ironically, the folks perpetrating this myth are trying to uh, purportedly support, which is getting more um, resources to those with uh, mental health issues. Because if folks, um, whether they're gun owners or not, um, don't you know neglect to um, or don't want to seek help for um, for their mental health because they're concerned that maybe someone will remove their gun or perhaps someone um, will judge them um, or track them in some way, then we're um, we're worse off than we started. So it's really important for us to get this right and to dispel all the myths around this issue. And so we're really, at Brady, we're very committed to doing that. Anybody else on the panel want to respond to that question about mental illness and, and gun violence? I, I'll mention something. It may not technically be mental illness, but over half of gun deaths are by suicide. And that number goes up uh, with, in states where there are less restrictive gun laws. And uh, research shows that a house that has guns is four times more likely to have a suicide event by gun than a household without guns. And there's something called, I think it's called the hour rule, or it's sort of an intuitive thing that people contemplate suicide and they have that feeling for an hour. And if that that hour passes, uh, they don't think of suicide anymore. But if they have a gun, 95% um, of the time that somebody tries to commit suicide uh, with, uh, with a gun uh, is effective in committing suicide. So uh, that's an arena that I think uh, need to pay more attention to. Anybody else on the panel want to talk about mental illness? Greg, you're nodding your head. 
No, I was, I was just totally agreeing with you. And I think um, one big challenge we have as a movement, I think we have to, we have a marketing challenge too. You know, when folks are thinking about how to protect their families and they protect their homes, a gun is typically the first option they go to. And um, without acknowledging the risk that's involved um, and looking at alternatives, I tell my friends, like, if you're trying to protect your home, get a dog first, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and then, uh, then get an alarm. <laughs> Maybe get an alarm on your house and a fence, you know, let's get some known deterrent from burglary or violence in your home versus getting something that will increase the risk of harm. Um, and so I think that's something we have to do more of and make sure that we are teaching people about what what they're actually getting into before it's too late. And I, and I don't think we're doing enough of that um, in the country. Right. And just to piggyback on um, what Greg said, I know he and I have talked about this a little bit and just how um, it's it's difficult to talk to folks about things like safe storage when you have the threat of suicide because people genuinely, um, you know, they have firearms in their home for protection and for, you know, as part of their family culture. And um, it's also important to, to just show people that this is just, it's part of the discussion of um, just to continue on the continuum of, of a safety discussion you have, just like you do about your you know, your car or your um, stove and kitchen when you teach your kids to um, cook. Um, it's really important to talk about safe storage and show that it's, you know, you can keep a gun um, locked, unloaded with ammunition separate and still the person who owns it can get to it if they if they feel that they want to get to it. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention andfamilyfire.org. That's Brady's safe storage program. Um, we've just launched our suicide prevention um, campaign along with the National Ad Council, our partner. And so if, um, if you go to that um, link, which I've, I've put at least in the, in the uh, Bishops United um, thread over here, I think, um, and familyfire.org, if you go to that, you'll see all kinds of links, information about safe storage, um, anything you want to share for free with your uh, friends, networks, organizations. Um, and it's, it's important to have that conversation with folks, whether it's um, folks with um, small kids in the, in the home, or if you've got an elderly relative at home who might own a gun, um, when you look at the suicide um, uh, prevention discussion, it's really, um, you can never assume anything um, because you don't know if someone in your household might be at a crisis point as, um, as Bishop Mark so, so accurately pointed out, it can be the difference between, um, well, between life and death. So it's a good discussion to have. Thank you. Next question is uh, directed to the two bishops uh, on the panel. Are there interfaith agencies that work for a unified faith-based community connection to address gun violence? Mark, I think you as our bishop liaison is actually the best bishop to answer this as compared to the conveners because that's your specific and particular role. Uh, I'm sorry to say though, and Mark can correct me, with respect to, there, there are interfaith efforts. There aren't huge denominationally organized commitments to in the gun prevention work, uh, gun violence prevention work at this stage. You know, if, if you are from a tradition other than the Episcopal Church and you're on this call, um, I would encourage you to speak to your leaders and ask them how they might get involved in the gun violence prevention work uh, we as Bishops United Against Gun Violence as a network of over 100 bishops in the Episcopal Church would be happy to work with any and all denominations and interfaith groups to say this is how we work and to partner. But Mark, if you want to answer this specific question, unless you know it, Daniel, that would be great. Yeah, um, we, as far as I know, the only organized group or network uh, of, a, of a religious uh, perspective that, now, that's not to say there are lots of individual ordained people who are working in gun violence prevention who are enormously helpful and have incredible witness, but uh, we are the only organized group save for Jewish women. Uh, my experience is there are lots of networks of Jewish women who, are, who have taken this on in a really, really big way and have made an enormous impact. Uh, but aside from that, there's not a, a, a coordinated effort. There was a group uh, that we, Bishops United, were close to uh, called um, 
Faith, Faith United Faith Against United Gun Violence. Gun. And that group is sort of uh, faded in the distance a bit over the past several years, partly because the founder and leader of that moved on to uh, other important issues. Daniel, any other response that you have? No, but this is again, the importance of being in your local context, because I do not know of a diocese in the Episcopal Church that it doesn't have interfaith organizations that we work with. Um, and this is a good time to join. And in Philadelphia, we are working with our Muslim uh, siblings, our uh, Jewish siblings on this issue. Uh, so I would encourage to go back to your specific locale uh, and uh, form these groups because local officials and state officials and national listen to their constituents. And if it comes uh, from the ground up, um, it's, it, you can move them in their voting. And that's why Karen Joy Kelly also notes, for example, that the Interfaith Action Association of Southwestern Michigan is active on the local level. There are lots of local levels. I was just speaking at the national level. The other groups, Mark, that we should also um, kind of highlight are Roman Catholic women religious orders, not as a coordinated body, but different religious orders of Roman Catholic women are also engaged in the gun violence prevention work. Yeah. Um, two related questions. How can people get more involved? And what resources can we offer to equip parishes and grassroots work with communities experiencing violence both within and outside our parishes? Rebecca, I'm gonna start with you. I'd say to get more involved, you know, join the Episcopal Public Policy Network, sign up for alerts from the organizations of the folks represented on this call, um, connect to the local organizations in your area doing work, um, vote, and then stay involved because we need to hold our elected officials accountable and, and they need to know what their constituents think and want on things. And as Bettina pointed out, you know, Americans are supportive of common sense gun reform and it needs to happen and hasn't. So I think on the kind of civic engagement side, there's a huge amount that we can do. Um, I'll, I'll let others speak to, again, the kind of more pastoral component or community-based responses to this, but on the advocacy side at the state, local, and federal level, which is where I focus exclusively, um, there's so much to be done, and we need the voices of constituents and people to be persistent and committed and um, looking really to the long term for this. This is We're in this for the long haul, and, and so we need all of your voices. Yeah, and Greg, uh, Community Justice Action Fund uh, has so many networks on the ground in urban areas offering advocacy, training, education, and solidarity. How can people get connected uh, with any or all of those groups? Yes, um, well, everything's digital now, so we can be anywhere. Uh, ask uh, Bishop Gutierrez. <laughs> He's traveling a lot. So. Um, but yes, you can sign up with us. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to our newsletter, um, cjactionfund.org. Um, we also have a monthly policy and organizing update call. Our next one is tomorrow night, actually, um, at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then right now, we are extremely focused on the election for the next two weeks. Um, we have our campaign called Elect Justice, and we have volunteer phone banks every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So you can sign up and just come join us in phone bank and we'll be calling into communities that have been impacted by gun violence, but also turning them out to vote specifically in Texas and Wisconsin. Um, and we also are text messaging people to vote. So you can also sign up um, at electjustice.org to help with that. So we have plenty of work for you to do in the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll have more trainings post-election uh, and more advocacy efforts post-election, uh, especially for folks who have a session that starts in the earlier part of 2021. But hopefully you guys can join us. Everyone is welcome. And Bettina, okay, so, let us know. Yes, yes. Last pitch for um, jumping onto BradyUnited.org and joining our um, effort, um, Voting Access Saves Lives, signing up on the, just signing up to help and finding some actions that you can do today and share with your friends and family. Um, and join a Brady chapter if you can. Um, get involved with work on the ground locally where you live um, in your state. Um, your, your voice matters and your effort really matters. It counts. Good, good. 
Well, we've had a lot of resources, a lot of wisdom shared here. Uh, uh, we've, um, we could go on, but I think in honoring our time, uh, we'll call it uh, to uh, close. And I want to call on Bishop Douglas to uh, offer some final remarks and a prayer. Thank you, Mark. Uh, before I wrap us up, I want to extend my profound debt of gratitude for all the bishops associated with the Bishops United Against Gun Violence to Bettina, Rebecca, and Greg for taking time to be with us and, and kind of resourcing us as you always do. We are such important um, companions in this work. And I thank God for your witness and for your faithfulness and for being here today. So thank you all. Um, one note, many of the resources that were mentioned today that were put in the chat as long, in addition to um, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Bishops United Against Gun Violence webpage. That's bishopsagainstgunviolence.org, bishopsagainstgunviolence.org. Um, so we'll try to keep this conversation going. Finally, uh, before praying, I want to really close with um, putting three asks for everyone who's participating here, three asks um, that we would invite you to consider and um, make. The first ask is vote, particularly as we are you know, trying to have legislators who are committed to safe gun, safe and sane gun legislation your vote matters. So have a plan to vote. If you haven't voted already, please make a plan to vote. Secondly, as you vote, or if you voted already, text four friends and encourage them likewise to vote. So text four friends. And finally, we are having a service of lament, hope, and resolve on October 27th at 5 p.m. And you'll be able to find that information also on our website and on our Facebook page. So please come back and join us for that service. It'll be an important service of, of prayer, of petition, of motivation, and also commitment as we come to the, the first Tuesday in November and all that that will entail. So once again, three asks, vote, Ask your friends and text your friends and encourage them to vote and join us again for a service of lament, hope, and resolve on October 27th at 5 p.m. Eastern. I want to close with two colics, uh, a colic for the oppressed and for our legislators, and then offer a blessing. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Look with pity, O heavenly God, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these, our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair proportion of the riches of this land through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. O God, the fountain of wisdom, whose will is good and gracious and whose law is truth. We beseech you to so guide and bless our senators and representatives in Congress, our president and our Supreme Court that they may enact such laws as shall please you to the glory of your name and the welfare of this people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day throughout the rest of this election season and forevermore. Amen.